tonight we're going to be in Romans chapter 2 as we continue our study called Brick by Brick. This week we're going to be talking about wrath. You go, oh, for Pete's sake, I don't want to talk about wrath. Listen, nobody wants to talk about wrath. But what I hope that we'll be able to do through our study tonight is that we realize that wrath, if we can understand it, it helps us to love and understand God just a little bit more. And so tonight's brick is going to be wrath. Um, but we're going to finish up Romans chapter 1. We're going to go verses 18 through 32. Let's ask God to um, bless our time. Heavenly Father, we know that Romans chapter 1 is one of the most controversial sections of Scripture in your whole word. I've heard more arguments about this text tonight than probably any other text Lord, I pray that tonight's message would be just like it says about Jesus in in John chapter 1, that Jesus was filled with truth and grace. I pray that this message tonight would be filled with truth and grace. Lord, as we talk about wrath and what does it look like for a society that has turned away from you, it's going to be tough. Every time I read the end of Romans chapter 1, Lord, I... I struggle with it because it tugs on so many different emotions. But Lord, as Christians, we need to know these things. We need to understand this text. And Once we get it out there and we can start understanding, okay, this is what God has to say. This isn't what my neighbor says or this isn't what my brother says or my sister or my friend. or my. This is what you have to say. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless us tonight in this study. Reveal yourself to us. Lord, help me to get out of the road so that your Holy Spirit can speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there's three things that we'll look at tonight with God's wrath. The first is the revelation of God's wrath. The second thing is the reason for God's wrath. And the third thing is the result of God's wrath. Guys, when we started praying about going through the book of Romans, this is the one study that I has been heavy on my heart. And if there's anything that we go over tonight where you say, hey, I disagree with what you say, or hey, I have a question about that, I would ask that you write it down. And we can talk about it afterwards. I am totally cool with us disagreeing on Scripture. You know, this is just one of those sections where once we get into it, you're going to understand, man, a lot of people have different perspectives. And one of the things that I have realized since I've started walking with the Lord is I don't care that much about what other people say when it comes to Scripture. What I care about is what does God have to say? And so this is one of those texts where it's, when you read it, it's tough. Because you realize that there's so many people that are going to disagree. But still we're going to continue forward. And I pray that we do it with love, truth, and grace. So let's dig into it. Hey, remember last week, I'll read the last two verses. It can almost make you want to jump up and down. Actually, 16 and 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith that is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul is walking this way, celebrating his boldness in the salvation of Jesus Christ. And then... Verse 18 comes, and look at how he does a 180. Now listen to what he says. For the wrath of God is revealed. Now underline revealed, because we talked about we're going to look at the revelation of God's wrath. Revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so let's talk about wrath. It says the wrath of God is revealed. So what is wrath? Okay, so, so wrath, as it's defined here, if we were to look at that Greek word, okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this pronunciation as I tend to do, but it's R-A, okay, O-R-G-E. Now that word, it means to properly desire, to have excitement, to have violent passion, 
by implication in punishment of anger, indignation, vengeance, or wrath. So what it means is it's when a person is extremely emotional about being angry. When you think about wrath, it's tough from a human point of view to understand how God can have wrath. And here's what we need to understand. Human beings don't have very good anger or wrath. We have to understand that God has perfect anger and wrath. He doesn't go into sin when he's angry. That means that when something happens, he's perfectly angry about it. Okay, let me give you some of the other usages in the Bible so that you can help to understand it. When wrath is brought up, here's a couple ways that it's used. It's used for anger, temper, character, movement or indignation of the soul, impulse, desire, any violent emotion, anger, wrath, indignation. Okay, so this is a very um, expressive emotion is wrath. Here's what we need to understand. And actually, it might be tough for us to understand. God's wrath is perfect. It's true, and it applies. Now, this comes on the heels of Paul announcing the righteousness by faith. We have to know that God's wrath is constant throughout the Bible. A lot of people think that God is wonderful and He's loving all the time. And although He is loving... It is very tough to pick up a book of the Bible and not see God's anger. If you go through Genesis, you're going to see God's anger. Noah and the flood. God was pretty upset that mankind had turned away. He was so upset that he took 99% of the population out. You know, you go through Exodus. What happened when, when Moses went up and got the tablets and he came back down and the people had already turned away and they were worshiping a cow? I got, I got pretty upset. That's wrath. You, know, you can't go through Deuteronomy or Joshua or Judges. Man, think about in Joshua when Achan stole the plunder that he wasn't supposed to and they killed him and his family. Okay, that's wrath. You go through Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all the prophets speak of God's wrath. A person that says that God is not angry has clearly not read the scriptures or does not understand them. Think about Jesus. When he came to the temple and they were selling things and they were making this obscene profit. And he flipped the tables. It's God's wrath. It is very emotional anger. Why? Why do we have to see God's wrath? Here's what we need to know. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The idea is simple, but it's sobering. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against the human race. And the human race deserves the wrath of God. Sometimes we like to object to the idea. We try to to make it like our anger, which is sinful. But what we have to understand of is that God is perfectly angry because we've sinned against Him. And this happened in the garden. It started there. God told Adam and Eve, listen, you can do, you can have all of this. Just don't do one thing. And what did they do? The one thing that they were told not to do. And what happened is, when sin entered the world, that's when cancer entered the world. Okay, remember, murder enters the world right, right after that. And that makes God angry because that wasn't the original plan. Eden was supposed to be heaven on earth. All of the pain and struggle, shootings, miscarriage, people dying, all of that is part of a fallen world. And God never intended that. And He's angry about it. When, when Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, when he talks about salvation, the question that we should be asking is, what are we being saved from? First and foremost, we are being saved from the wrath of God that we righteously deserve. Unless there is something to be saved from, there is no point in talking about salvation. Let me say that again. That comes from a guy named Morris. Unless there is something to be saved from, There is no point 
in talking about salvation. In this portion of the book of Romans, in this letter, Paul's goal is not to proclaim the good news, but to demonstrate the absolute necessity of the good news of salvation from God's righteous wrath. Okay, so last week we learned about how we're saved from God's wrath. This week we have to talk about what does that look like. And although this is painful, guys, it makes Romans, the first part of Romans chapter 1, so much better when we dare to go and understand this part of it. The wrath of God is not revealed in the gospel, but is in facts of human experience. Okay, what Paul is going to describe here is that this is a society that is turned away from God. It's going to be alarming. When you read this, you're going to think about, boy, does this look like my society? Now, a lot of the, the commentators or the pastors that have studied the scripture, they tend to believe that Paul is talking to the Gentile world here, which I think is, you know, that, that, that it definitely sounds um, right on point. Next week, we're going to be talking about Paul's going to turn to the Jewish group. Um, but, it, but again, you can look at this group and understand how it's a lot like the society that we're in. Okay, so who is God having this wrath against? All right, it shows us three, three people that it's against that have the wrath of God. First, it's the ungodliness. Against all ungodliness. And what do we need to know about God, ungodliness? That means that it's an absence of God. So he's speaking to a group that They've turned away from him, and he is not to be found within this group. Second characteristic is the unrighteousness. Now that is the opposite of righteous people. Now a righteous person doesn't mean that they've got it all together. Like we learned last week, a righteous person just means that they have been covered by Jesus' righteousness because they put their faith in him. If we equated it to kind of like if I were to put a red coat over Nicholas. And you could only get this red coat by one way, and that is if I gave it to him. He couldn't get the coat on his own. But once I give it to him, our Heavenly Father sees the red coat for what it is, not for what Nicholas is. This is the opposite of that. This is a person that is not covered, that is totally naked. That is the unrighteous Now, if you think about what is the opposite of salvation, the opposite of salvation would be death. So these are people that are headed for destruction. The next part that it says, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. All right, suppressors. This is where you can understand the anger of God. This means of people that know the truth, but they just hide it. Now, a really good way that I heard this described, it's kind of like in a, you know, in a trial when there is some um, evidence that is suppressed. Maybe the police have done something that they weren't supposed to do with the evidence and it gets pushed out. Now, the defense lawyers are always trying to get all of the evidence thrown out. What they're trying to do is they're not trying to say that it isn't true. What they're saying is, we don't want it to be talked about here. So they want to suppress it. Now the lawyer knows if it's true or not, but they're suppressing it. That's the same exact way with some people. They know the truth, but they tend to just suppress it. And this makes God very, very angry. It makes me angry too. All right, and when I start reading about how um, different movements within our country are going after the youth, it makes me furious to think that my children are targets. Somebody that may know the right way, but they want to do it their own way. Oh, it makes my blood boil. That's exactly what we're talking about here. This is making God angry that people would go and, and, and suppress the truth. <clears throat> this is a sin that appeared first in Genesis 3. Remember, Adam and Eve knew what was the truth. They knew what was right and wrong. So did Satan. But they said, we, we really don't care. We, we don't care, God, that you told us don't, not to eat from this tree. We're doing it anyways. And that sin is called pride. And that is the downfall of human nature. 
is that we're okay with saying, God, we got this. Okay, what, what that isn't saying is, we don't believe in you. Some people are totally cool with saying, I, I, I can acknowledge that you exist, but I don't care. I'd rather do things my way. Those are ones that suppress. All right, let's talk about the revelation of wrath here. It's important, but it's incredibly controversial to talk about. Now, there's three ways that we tend to make decisions. The first way is that we make decisions off of emotion. This is what I'm feeling. How many decisions have you made in the last couple of weeks just off of emotion? Right? We do it with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Elias says to me almost every morning, I would like a freezy pop for breakfast. She is operating off of emotions. I want a freezy pop. The second way that we make decisions is is off of is it true or not. This is what I believe to be true. Okay, a lot of times people will look at something and say that's true, and this is why I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to base my decision. What's interesting about this is that sometimes we can be wrong even though we think something is true. So this way can tend to let us down. The way that William Wilberforce got rid of slavery in the United Kingdom was that he revealed to people what was actually happening to slaves. And once people understood, I can't believe that this is happening, that's how the tide changed. He helped them to realize what you think is true is not actually true. So sometimes knowing the truth can let us down when we make decisions. But the third way is revelation. And what a revelation is, is this is what God has revealed to me. Revelation is God's way of correcting bad teaching. When you think about how Jesus did his ministry, you saw this all over the place. When Jesus hit the scene, all the time he was going back and he was correcting. They thought that they had the Ten Commandments down pat. Thou shall not murder. So they went around and said, okay, if I'm not murdering, I'm good. What Jesus did was he spoke revelation into that scripture. And he says, guys, listen, you think you're good because you haven't actually physically murdered somebody? But here's the deal. If you think about it, you've already committed it. And I look at that as guilt. I look at you as being guilty of that sin. Same thing with adultery. You guys think you're good because you haven't physically had an affair. But you're lusting after them in your mind. And so I look on. And Jesus raised the stakes. What he was doing was he was revealing to them what the scripture actually meant. This week, write down Matthew 23 and just go through. And look at how Jesus talked to the Pharisees. He went through and he picked apart everything that they're doing. And he basically said, listen guys, you got it wrong. You say, Ben, why are you bringing this up tonight? Because, guys, when we talk about the topics that we're going into tonight, most of our country bases their decisions on these types of sins, on emotion or what they think to be true. The problem is, is that the third one, what does God have to say about these sins, is very rarely the place that we go to. When I came to Christ, I started to understand that it didn't really matter what I thought or believed. Okay, I'll be honest with you guys. I would have considered myself to be a pro-life person growing up. The only problem is, is that I was actually pro-choice. You see, I would look on and I would say, well, except in cases of rape and incest and, you know, if the mom's life is in danger. And what I realized is that's actually, from the way I see it, that's a pro-choice view. Pro-life means you look on it at every life in the womb and you go, that is sacred. Now, I disagreed with that until I started reading the scriptures. But when the Lord was revealing to me, this is a human life that I'm knitting together in the womb. Who was I? Now, I came face to face with, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I think to be true to God going, but this is how it is. And what happened is over time, I started to realize it didn't matter if I thought that that was the right thing to do or not. God said that this is the right thing to do, and I started to change. Revelation should be the way that we make our decisions. When you look on at our text tonight, think about 
Do people make these decisions based on emotions, based on facts, or based on revelation? Okay, now point number two. The reason for God's wrath. Let's pick it up in verse 19. <clears throat> because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Okay, now let's pause there for a minute. That is a alarming text that we just read by Paul. He says that God has manifested himself to who? To the unrighteous? To the unbelieving? And what do we get from that? Guys, there's a lot of times where people will not believe in God because they'll say, well, if you have to give your life to Jesus, well, what about the little kids in Africa that don't have a Bible? Right? How often have you heard that? All you have to do is go back to this scripture. It says that God is revealing himself to them. He's making himself manifest to them. He is showing himself to everybody. It tells us that God will do his thing with every person. We need to stop worrying about how God's going to reveal himself to other people and just understand that he is God. He's perfect. He's a perfect judge. He's not going to bring somebody into his courtroom and convict them of a crime that they didn't commit. So what's he going to do? He's going to be fair. Instead of worrying about how he's going to reveal himself to other people, let's worry about how he reveals himself to us. Let's go on to verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The next thing that we can note is that we should understand things made point to God. Some of the easiest ways that we can find God is in people. Because every person is made in the image of God. Another way that we can look at God is we look at nature. We, we were talking about today, Madison was talking about, when you start to dig into how a, a woman gives childbirth, it is very difficult to look on and say, this was not, this was done by a creator. This didn't just happen. Right? And there's some theories out there that, have you ever heard some of the different theories about how eyeballs were made? That it started with a fish getting sunburned and then an eyeball developed out of it? It takes more faith to believe in that than to believe that there's a creator. When we look around in nature, look at what an eyeball does. You can't just put a whole bunch of things in a jar and shake it up for a couple thousand years and then out pops an eyeball. No, when you look at an eyeball, you understand that this was created. This was created by a creator. You say, well, why in the world don't people believe that anymore? Well, where do we learn about science? We, we learn it from schools that don't allow God in there anymore. You think about how our country was founded. Families used to do all the education. Kids used to grow up in the home. So the kids were taught by the parents. You had a direct, this is God. You can see it in all these different areas. But then what we started to do is we started to outsource education to the community. And these schools started to happen. And at first, what do you think that people were learning? They were learning from the Bible. Exactly. History books were the Bible. Science. All these wonderful things. But a little bit over time, he started to get taken out. Now if you even bring him up, you could get in trouble. So how do we learn about science without understanding that Jesus should be involved in it? Now you have 12 years of teachers basically taking God out of everything. And it's not their fault. I, 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 I have two parents that are teachers. I love teachers. But what we've done as a society is we've said, let's take God out. It should be no surprise that we look on at our youth and they go, well, where in the world is he? Instead of teaching him, hey, when, when my daughter says that her favorite color is pink, how can I say, listen, isn't it so cool that God created pink? He, he created pink so that you could enjoy it. Freezy pops. Okay, that comes from sugar. 
Sugar is something that God created so that we can enjoy in our mouths. Do you understand how we can start to get into the, to the place where we go, everything points to God. Everything points to God. When we look around at all of the individuals in the political atmosphere that are driving us crazy right now, I've been starting to do this, is that I start to look at these tough political figures and understand that at one point they were just a little baby like Harvard Grace. These politicians that are so angry right now, at one point, they're a sweet little baby that somebody was holding. Right? And every one of these people that drive us bonkers were made in the image of God. He reveals himself to us. He reveals himself to everyone. <clears throat> Let's move on. Verse, uh, verse 20 and 21. <clears throat> so that they are without excuse. God makes it very simple there. Listen, we don't have an excuse. He's already revealed Himself to us. He says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. What's God upset about here? That they didn't glorify Him. A better way to look at it is that they weren't thankful. The problem here is being prideful and not giving thanks. That was Satan's downfall. He thought he was it. Not only did he think he was just so talented and wonderful, but he actually thought that he could take over for God. We have to be very, very careful of this. Because that's what's taking down our society, and that's what will take us down. What's the opposite of that? How do you fight back against pride? You become thankful. You start thanking the Lord for these things. You know, it's, it's interesting to watch an NFL game or an NBA game. I love LeBron James. But when he dunks, that guy is like, what, six? Eight, six, nine. I mean, it isn't that tough for him to reach up and dunk. And he's got to be careful that he doesn't get too blown up because why? God gave him those abilities. I used to love how Tim Tebow would always give praise to God for everything that happened to him. That's a good way for us to battle back against it. Okay, let's go into the third section, the result of God's wrath. Verse 22, it says, Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of an incorruptible... They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Now what happened here? And this seems crazy to us, but we do it all the time. We'd rather worship other things than God. They exchanged being wise for being a fool. This is not beyond us. If you think about the history of mankind, we've passed it down. Adam and Eve knew God. They walked with Him. They loved Him. Yet they took the word over a serpent. They took the word of a serpent over God, knowing that God is God. All right, Adam was there when God was forming these animals or when he was telling him to name these animals. He got to see all of these wonderful things, and yet he turned away. You think about the, the Israelites. I cannot imagine what it had to have been like to be a part of the ten plagues. Right, Seeing all of these things, and they're predicted. Listen, he went in there and said, this is what's going to go down. This is what's going to go down. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Ten times. Boom, 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 boom. And if that wasn't enough, to walk out of there and to see these seas get parted and to walk through, and then he brings the water back down and crushes the army. But what did they do? They started worshiping a cow because they were, they were, they were sick of waiting for Moses to come back down. Listen, if they saw all those ten plagues walk through the ocean 
and they still turned away from God, what, what that should do to us is to go, listen, it's easy. It's easy to turn away from God. The problem is not that man has not known God, but that they did know Him, yet they refused to glorify Him. Therefore, mankind is without excuse. Instead of glorifying God, we transformed the idea of Him into forms and images more comfortable to our corrupt and darkened hearts. That word that he uses there in Romans one twenty three. For image is icon. An icon is basically the, the invisible or the visible image of an invisible God. And that's, and that's Jesus. I mean, when you go back and you read scripture about how Jesus was this image of God in the flesh that people could see. And we have four accounts of his life. And people still look on. Why? Well, because that's, that, that's what we do as a society. Okay, let's go on to the next part. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. Verse 24, it says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. <clears throat> for this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even the women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, in receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. All right, now I want to pause here for a minute, and I just want to talk about a couple things before we get into this. Talking about homosexuality and same-sex attraction is, is, is probably the most emotionally charged topic that I've seen since I've been walking with the Lord. There's a couple of things that I want to make sure that we understand before we move forward. Okay, there's, first off, is that if it's in the Bible, okay, if it's in God's scriptures, I think that we not only can talk about it, but we should. I think that our society is, is yearning for what is true. I think that our children are looking around going, for Pete's sake, what is, what is real? What is good? Right? We're giving them all of these different things. It's good to know what God has to say about this. Okay. And the next thing is, and please understand my heart, this message in this text is not to go and bash somebody over the head with. Okay, this is not a club to just go and hit somebody with. This is coming from a pastor it feels the need to share with, with, with his group. Okay, just as Paul was writing this letter in Corinth, which was dealing with the same issue, to Rome that was dealing with the same issue, we're dealing with it here in Tiffin. Okay, and we need to know, what, 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 do we, what, what should we feel? And so if it's in the Scriptures, we should talk about it. If it's not in the Scriptures... I don't ever think that we, we shouldn't talk about something that's not in here. That's why we study the Scriptures verse by verse every week. Because this is what we should be talking about. The next thing is, I am not a judge, and neither are you. This is not coming from a place of judgment. This, this area is not, this, is, this isn't a judgment seat. This is a watchman. Okay, this, is, this is coming from a place of we should be looking out, just as Paul did. Guys, look out for this. We're also to be witnesses. Jesus told us to go, therefore, and to preach. Okay, so this is part of that. 
But the next thing that we need to understand is that the, the church walks together towards Jesus. What that means is, if any of us are dealing with any types of sins, this is a group that will walk with you. No matter what you're dealing with. And that's what we have to be. Okay, we have gotten to the point when it comes to this topic, we, we tend to go one of two places, and both of them are super dangerous. Okay, One side is we go way, way, way over here. And this side, when it comes to this topic, is so stuck on what truth is, that they will bash anybody that deals with it. Okay, this group that's way, way, way over here, they're the ones that are disowning their children. They're the ones that are saying, I don't accept you and I don't love you until you change this behavior. Now, because of this, we have kids that are killing themselves. Okay, because of this, the church is looked on as intolerant, as bigots, as jerks, and understandably so. We can't do that. We can't kick people out of church because they're struggling. This here is a hospital. This is not an interview room. Okay, you don't come in here to be your best you. You come in here to get better. So we need to understand that, that we as Christians need to walk with people through things. Okay, the next thing that we need to note is sanctification, guys, is dirty. If you guys have been walking for Jesus with any period of time, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. When I came to Jesus, I was addicted to porn. I was addicted to alcohol. I was a smoker. Megan and I were living together and sinning together. I was a mess. But when I walked into Calvary Chapel, they didn't say, hey, buddy, hit the bricks. We heard what you did. Even when I started to tell my pastor what I was doing, he didn't kick me out. Even when I told him that I was living and sinning with this woman, he didn't kick me out. He said, let's walk together through it. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. Okay, now let me swing all the way over this way. Because there's danger in this side as well. Now this side relies so much on acceptance that they will let anything fly. Okay, that's the that's the group that says, hey, let's just take Romans chapter one and let's take just rip it right on out. We'll rip out a little bit of First Corinthians. It doesn't matter. You can live a godly life and still be living in a in a gay relationship. That's totally fine. The danger with that is. And we'll talk about it tonight. Is that God also says, don't, He says, don't do that. Okay, we can't get to the point where we're telling people something that is wrong. Okay, if we start to say, hey, you can do whatever you want, we're not worshiping ourselves. We are worshiping the creation, not the creator. And so there's this nice happy medium that we're going to try to find, which is truth and grace. The next thing that we have to understand, and I'm just going to say it, is that we get to the point where people think that God hates sex. And that he's totally against it. And guys, what we'll start to understand is that God created it. And he does not want that. But he does put boundaries on it. And he's allowed to because he invented it. If you want it a different way, then create your own universe. But until then, we're not playing by your rules. <clears throat> the next thing is I want you to remember that we have to let the text speak too often we get upset at what we feel instead of what God has said we need to make decisions based on revelation and the last thing is next week we're going to learn about the, the sin that we all deal with. So there, as I was going through these studies, there's a part of me that wishes we could have done next week's study because next week's study deals with we're all sinners. All right? And that's one thing that we have to understand. But what, 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 what's really neat about what Paul says next week is that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Okay, going up to somebody that is living in some sort of a lifestyle and saying, hey, Love the sinner, hate the sin. That doesn't help anybody. Nobody has ever turned and said, boy, you know what, that's it. I'm walking, no. Why? Because it doesn't help anybody. A pastor that I really enjoy says, you know what we should be saying is love the sinner and hate your own sin. 
I've always loved that. Because that should be our attitude. Instead of looking around at what everybody else is doing wrong, man, it's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. Let me, let, me, let me work on what I'm struggling with, and let me pray for you. You say, well, Ben, isn't the Bible open to interpretation? I mean, you know, the, the text that you just read there from Romans, that could, that, you know, it could totally mean something different. I mean, words meant this and words meant that. Let me read to you a couple things. Okay, Hebrews 4, 12 said, The word of God is living and powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword. Let me read to you from Revelation 22 and 18 and 19. If anyone adds to these things, talking about God's word, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. You say, well, Ben, but th- aren't there parables in the Bible? I mean, how, I mean, how do you know that that's just not a parable and that's just not a, a way that could be interpreted another way? Listen, look up Jesus, or in Matthew 13, 10 through 17. Jesus talks about why he uses parables. And guys, I've heard it abused. Some people will look on and say, Adam and Eve was just a parable. Noah was just a parable. You could look on then and say, well, Jesus was just a parable. You can't do that. Jesus showed us when he was speaking in a parable. Adam and Eve was not a parable. Noah was not a parable. Jesus was not a parable. You you, you have to understand when is a parable a parable and when is real life real life. And, And what it says in Revelation is if you start adding to things, you're in trouble. If you start taking away things, you're in trouble. So what do we have to do? We have to hold this word of God up and go, i got to understand what this word means. What does this phrase mean? Okay, is this true or not? Is the Bible open to interpretation? I'll tell you guys, I think that that is such a dangerous thing. I had a guy, we were at the farmer's market, painting faces, right? And this guy came from across the way and he said, tell me about Calvary Tiffin. I said, okay. And he asked me a first question and he was asking, you know, just about the way that we set things up. And the second thing was, he says, now tell me about how do you guys feel about gay marriage? Now, as I started to share with him, he said, interpretation. The Bible is open to interpretation. And as I went home that night, I thought, man, like this guy, we didn't even really get to talk. But isn't it interesting that he didn't come up and ask me, what does God say about this? Or what does God say about that? He could have asked me a hundred different topics. Why would he bring that one up? Because that's what he's emotional about. We've got to be careful when it comes to interpretation. Next question, you say, well, Ben, homosexuality is only mentioned a handful of times in the scriptures. Why should we make a big deal about it? That's correct. It's only covered a handful of times. A couple times in the Old Testament, a couple times in the New. But what's important is when it is covered, it is specific. We have to remember that the Bible isn't about homosexuality. It's not. A lot of people think that it is. The Bible is not even about being straight. The Bible is not about being married. The Bible, guys, isn't even about you. The Bible is all about Jesus. It is all about a loving God that created us, lost us because we fell into sin, is passionately in love with us and did what it took to get us back. That's what the Bible is about. You say, well, Ben, isn't it true that Christians just pick and choose which Old Testament text to follow? <clears throat> A lot of times people get upset at Leviticus chapter 18. And if you read it, I've, I've already gone way past my time already, so we're not going to get into it. But if you read Leviticus 18, there's something that you need to know about it. God talks about homosexuality there, and he uses a very tough word. He says it's an abomination. Now, people look on and go, well, if you are going to stick to uh, Leviticus 18, well, then you can't wear a a, a cotton and a linen shirt. And you can't play football because that's touching a dead animal. Now, listen, what we have to understand is you need to be able to go through and understand God's law. Some of it, you're right. Listen, man, when God was talking about 
that we shouldn't be wearing cotton and linen, he was talking about his priest. He didn't want his priest to wear cotton. He didn't want them to sweat while he was doing work. So yes, if you are a Levitical priest, back in the Old Testament, you should not be wearing cotton. You are correct. But that is not binding on the Christian today. Leviticus 18 is a definition of sexual immorality. Okay, so when God defines what is homosexuality, he's just giving a definition, and then he says, don't do these things. <clears throat> we'll get into that in a minute. But it's important for you to know what is it in the Old Testament that is binding on us, and what is it that isn't. You say, well, Ben, how in the world am I supposed to know that? Well, listen, that's what we go through here. The second book of the Bible that we studied here was Exodus, and we went through a lot of this, and we're going to get into it in the following weeks. I ask you guys, read ahead, because we're going to go over what does the law mean? How does that apply to our lives today? We'll go through and we'll be able to understand, okay, out of, the, out of these things, this is what's applying. As we keep going into the Word, we're going to start to understand it more. And you can ask, we can go through. That's basically why the book of Galatians was written. Because people were just running around going, I don't know what I'm supposed to follow anymore. Galatians is, listen guys, this is what you can do. <clears throat> you say, well Ben, isn't it true that Jesus didn't actually teach or mention homosexuality? There's three things I want you to understand about Jesus' teaching. First, is that Jesus taught for three years. We have a handful of his messages. So for you to sit there and say, Jesus never mentioned this, we actually don't know that. He could have mentioned lots of different things. But we got a, a, a handful of his messages. Okay, the second thing is, <clears throat> think about how Jesus taught his disciples. He said to them in Mark 8.34, Whoever wants to, wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So the same person that will come flying and say, Jesus never said this. Remember, Jesus called people to give up everything. That's including the things that you want to follow him. The third thing is, Jesus taught about sexual immorality. I want you guys to go to Mark chapter 7, verse 20 real quick. Just flip a couple books over to Mark. Listen to what Jesus says here in Mark 7, 20 through 23. He says, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these things come from the inside and defile a person. No. If you circle that word for sexual immorality, it can be translated to porneia. You say, well, what in the world is porneia? Porneia is a Greek word that defines what sexual immorality is. It's where we get our word pornography. Now, if you go back to Leviticus 18, I want you to just imagine that there's a big cup here. Okay, and this cup is sexual immorality. What happens in Leviticus is that they drop things in, okay? homosexual relationships, put that into sexual immorality. Having sex with animals, put that in there. And he lists a whole bunch of things. This is sexual immorality. What Jesus is saying is, stay away from this. So when people say, hey, listen, Jesus doesn't actually talk about it. Listen, that's a tough one because he's referencing this group. You say, well, Ben, are you saying that Jesus is anti-gay? I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. Jesus was anti-gay just as much as he was anti the person struggling with pornography, anti the person struggling with alcohol, anti the person struggling with anger. If Jesus is anti-gay, how did he hang out with Judas? Think about this. It's nuts to think about his relationship with Judas. Jesus created Judas. Right? Judas was created through Jesus and for Jesus. He knew that he was going to sin and that he was going to betray him. 
for three years he poured into him, knowing that he wasn't going to love him and follow him. And at the very end, he still gave him another shot, knowing that he wouldn't. If, if Jesus is anti-gay, then he's anti-Judas, and that's just not true. The Bible says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So to look on and say that Jesus is anti-gay, that's crazy. Would you leave heaven for somebody that you don't want? Somebody that you're against? I mean, the whole entire world is fallen. To look on and say that Jesus is anti-gay is... It's anti-smart. Right? That's, that's just what he did. That was his mission, was to come for us. In conclusion... Homosexuality is talked about in the Old Testament. It's reaffirmed in Jesus' teaching. And what we see tonight is that it's taught in the church to the church. Now listen, Romans is to the church. So if you have something from the Old Testament, Jesus reaffirms it. Remember, if, when we were going through our study in Acts, what did they say to the young church? Remember the, 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 the Jews, okay? They were coming to the faith. And they were saying, well, what do we do about circumcision? And what do we do about these feasts? And what do we do about this? And what do we do about that? And I don't know if you guys were here for that study, but Paul basically came back and said, there's three things that we're going to do. Okay, Stay away from idols. Stay away from food that's been strangled. And stay away from sexual immorality. Or this cup. right? Stay away from it. This is the three things that they said to the church. So it was practiced in the church. And now Paul is telling the church in Corinth, are in Rome, and he's also going to say it to the church in Corinth. Paul also talks about it to Timothy. That, that is actually a lot of references. You also have to understand that Paul is saying it as a pastor to his, his group. Why would he do that? Because they're asking, what do we do about this? Do you think Paul wants to preach this message? Do you think I wanted to preach this message tonight? I have just been struggling with how in the world do we go at this, knowing that so many people are hurt by this. It doesn't mean that we still don't need to know the truth. The other thing is that if you feel that this sin is ranked higher than any of the other sins, then you should leave right now because we're about to show you that it's not. Okay, look at what it then goes on to say. <clears throat> okay, so, so, so Paul talks about it, 26 and 27. He talks about lesbianism, and then he talks about homosexuality with men. He says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to their parents. I mean, for Pete's sake, how many of us are guilty of that? <clears throat> Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, man, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. You can't, you can't read that text without getting convicted. Because every one of us, I'm going to guess, has dealt with some of it. And people tend to go back and forth. Hey, is homosexuality uh, a worse sin than all these other ones? And I've heard different people. I've had conversations going, well, you know, well, it doesn't matter. What we need to know is that there's different consequences. Okay, there's a different consequence for every sin. God is, God, God can't be around sin. So whether it's a little teeny tiny one or whether it's a big one, it's sin. Jesus died for it. When he was on the cross, he took all of our wrath. And it's like he put it into a cup and he drank it.
Here Paul is given a practical description of what it looks like to live in a society that is totally fallen. You say, well, Ben, well, what about my friends or what about my brother who believes that he was born gay? Can you tell me that Jesus created this guy gay and now he's mad about it? Listen, we have to understand that we were all born into a fallen world. That means that when I was born, I wasn't born so much with a dependency to drink alcohol, but I was born with brokenness. Okay, All of us have areas that we struggle and we go off into different paths. That's the fallen nature that we have. So whether it's Sexual immorality, or anger, or covetousness. Guys, do you know what covetousness is? It's wanting something that you can't have. How many of us go to the mall and want something that we can't afford? How many of us will drive from here home and see a car that we want and can't afford? Or a house that we want and we can't afford? That's covetousness. I realized when Megan and I, before we had gotten married... When we were figuring out how to live, because we were living and sleeping together, but now we're realizing, okay, God doesn't like that. Well, I used to think about Megan in a sexual way, and then I realized I'm coveting this woman that is not my wife. And And this whole time I thought, hey, I'm good, it's Megan, she's about to be my wife. And then I realized God was saying, she is not your wife. Until you marry her, you're coveting. I thought, man, how many times in the Word does it say don't covet? And God's really upset about it. We can't rank sin. They're all bad. But what we do need to work on is what are we struggling with? Okay, so let me, and here's where we're close. I I definitely went over, but we're almost done. I want to ask you, when we talked about all of those things did that sound like America to you? Isn't that us? Ungrateful? Or what do they say? Unloving? Man how many, we can't love anybody right now in our country anybody says anything political for Pete's sake we have no problem beating the tar out of them I mean, if you want to talk about something that is passionate to you, somebody will scream in your face. We don't know how to love people right now. Let me ask you again. Do you do you feel like that describes Tiffin? Yeah. What's scarier is, do you feel like that describes the church? That's what's tough. Is it when you go through a lot of these things, that's normal church these days. You say, okay, Ben, you have talked for an hour about how terrible this society is. What in the world am I supposed to do with this? Guys, this should bring us back to a place just where we were last week of coming to the foot of the cross and going, this is nuts, God. We're all struggling with so many things, but yet you still love us. So when I was teaching tonight, there's probably something that hit a nerve somewhere. And so I'd ask these three questions for you to ask yourself this week. What is it that God pointed out that you need to work on? Out of that big list. Psalm 65.3 says, Though sin fills our hearts, You forgive them all. Focus on this this week. What is it that God wants to change in your life? Before you can take that big piece of wood out of somebody else's eye, you got to take, or before you take the speck out of somebody else's eye, you got to take that big piece of wood out of yours. Number two. I want you to know that Calvary Tiffin is here to walk with you through any of that. No matter what you're struggling with, we were given the church to walk and do life together. And I want you to know that we are here to walk with you through it. And number three, this is where we'll end. 
As we talk about next week, remember that the goodness of God leads to repentance. How can you be an agent of God's goodness this upcoming week?